Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. I am uh, excited to be here with you this morning to continue in uh, our sermon series, Reconciling, Reconciling Your Life. I want to say thank you to Miguel for an incredible communion. Um, I had to run out there and hug Sean. It's been awesome watching him grow. Great contribution from him. And I just think all the brothers and sisters that were up here from the welcome to the prayers and everything, you can, spirit, you can see the spirit of God working in, the, in their lives in every way. And I want to thank you guys that have participated up here today. I want to have a prayer and then I want to jump into this portion of the lesson. Um, it's important that we really get today. Today may be, a, although there's one more to go, maybe a culmination of all of it, um, and if applied to your life, will, will, will change your life. But the key word, the optimum word here is applied to your life. Uh, so let's pray. Our God in heaven, thank you so much that we can wake again once a day to take a breath. Uh, Father, to come together to fellowship, to hear your word, to make amends with you, to worship you, to say thank you, to receive again your grace and your mercies, which are new every day. Father, your power that was made to us by the cross of Jesus, the power to live a life that, that's no, like no other life. Father, different than the world, and I pray that every member here is taking advantage of that. And Father, we're walking in a way that brings you glory and honor, and that it impacts and touches those that are around us, that our influence is pulling people toward heaven and not hell, that our influence is encouraging and making a positive world and not one that's full of dismay and dissolution. Help us to be strong in our walk. Give us, uh, give us endurance. Give us courage. And Father, give us great faith. Be with me as I preach this lesson this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. We have been preaching this uh, sermon series on reconciling your life, six key areas, six key areas of conflict that takes place in a Christian's life that must be resolved in order for them to grow in faith. Um, why is it that we have uh, so many churches and you can go on a, on a block radius and a two block radius and a church on every corner and everything, but then you, you're not safe to stand in that community. Something's wrong, something's not taking place in the, today's churches, today's Christians, that we have, we're no different, we look no different than those that are in the world. And today I want us to, to think about those things. We have to reconcile things. God gave us the message of reconciliation. That's what he gave us, making us ambassadors to take his message to the world as though he was making his appeal directly through us. We are his mouthpiece, his voice, his example. That's who we are as Christians to the world. And we talked about our images and how they must come from the inward character of Jesus Christ as to win the acceptance and approval of God, not man. Often too long, often we uh, get our images based on trying to be accepted in this world, trying to be liked, trying to be a part of things to win the approval of man. We talked about our faith that has to come through a clear conscience. There's a difference in a conscience. A conscience is the basis in which we make our moral decisions. A clear conscience means our thoughts and our actions do not offend the reputation of God. It also means that there's no one that I know of that can point a finger at me and say I've offended them, and yet I have not asked their forgiveness. We have talked about our purpose. There's a big difference between desires and purpose. Purpose, you, when you're used for what you were designed for, you will not burn up in the heat of life. But when you are solely about desires, you will get burnt up because desire is about what you can get and purpose is about what you can give. We talked about peace and unities and how we have taken how we were raised in our homes and interacted in our families, and how it can hurt our lives when we come into the church when we bring those same behaviors, thought patterns into the church. It makes the church no different than the dysfunction we've experienced growing up. And today we're going to talk about power living. Power living through moral purity. It's important that we understand that there's a set of principles that, that, that God has set forth for us to live by, and it is those principles that give us power, power to live our lives. Let me read with you a passage to begin, how God wants each of us to live and what he wants for us. Turn with me to Psalms 112. 
This is the life we're supposed to have continuously in God. Psalms 112, we'll start in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. It is not out of duty, but out of delight that they obey his commands. You know, we remember that repentance requires two things. Of course, it requires that we stop doing it, right? It does. But it also means that we change our minds to agree with God. Our heart is the same as God. If we have not become loving and we've been bitter and angry, we not only stop being bitter and angry, but we change our mind to agree with God that love conquers all. We don't just dutifully do things. We change and we learn to delight like God delights. Once your mind is like God's about any particular area of sin in your life, you will change it. Nobody goes away from things they enjoy. They do it. They run from pain, but they run toward pleasure. And when you take delight in the laws of God, you will run toward them more and more. Their children will be mighty in their land. Talk about the plan for the next generation. Fear the Lord. Be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are theirs, of their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. God will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. One of the hardest things in the world to me is to see someone not live up to their potential. Oftentimes that I go and, and I get to play basketball with these young men and I see this incredible incredible talent and, 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 and they, they, they should be somewhere playing on someone's professional team and yet they're in this gymnasium and, 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 and this is the only level they have reached and when you, when you listen to them talk they will blame it on somebody, some system as though other kids haven't come from the projects, though other kids haven't come from uh, abused homes and though other kids were not born into families where the parents were crack addicts and af uh, uh, alcoholics. They will, they will make every excuse in the world as to why they have not acceded to their potential. They have no power to live their lives. They have no foundation in which they built. Today, we're going to talk a little bit differently. And I pray that you will meditate and apply with the scriptures and the things we will learn. Because moral purity is basically another word for holiness. 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 What does this word mean? It means to be separated for the Lord. Those that are separated, been set aside for God's purpose, for his purpose, his plan, and his will. And we've learned that you cannot know your plan and your will in your life until you've submitted your life to the will of God himself. Once you've done that, you can start figuring out what this life and this world down here is about. But as long as it's backwards and you're searching your will above his will, you will be in confusion and dismay for the entire rest of your life. But when we use that word holiness, it's scary. It's a scary word. And to the average American, it's terrifying. We don't need to be scared of it, but it's terrifying. Our tendency is to think of holiness would never find its way into our jobs, conducting ourselves holy at work that it would never find its way into our schools. It would never find its way, you know, maybe a, when our kids are young, we, we want them to be cute and cuddly, but we don't think, let me make him holy at that age. We're not thinking in that way. We just don't view holiness that way. Teenagers in their busy schedule are not thinking being holy because this word holy has always been uh, seen when you give the description of it as some bearded guy, you know, some gaunt, Thing, some, some religious chanting, 
Um, there may be some stained glass. We gotta have that building effect. We gotta have all that coming around. Uh, it just, it just, you know, it has to have this sense of. Whew. Let us pray. Let's face it. Holiness is something that we think belongs in monasteries. It needs the organ playing behind it. It seems highly appropriate for us in this 21st century. You know, when I uh, went fishing one time, I was in Manila, Philippines, and I went fishing in a place called Smoky Mountain. They've renamed it now, but I went there as a, as a young man. Um, I think I was about 24 years old, and I was playing ball there for a team called Great Taste Coffee, and I, I used to always go out into, thank you, I used to always go out uh, into the village and everywhere, and I went to this place, Smoky Mountain, a very poor area, and they have rivers there, and uh, these rivers are just, uh, just full of debris and different things, and probably not somewhere many of us would even take a swim, but here's where they swam, they washed, they fished, they did everything, and I went fishing with these, these, these young guys, and they wanted me to go with them. Uh, I'm the biggest thing walking around Manila at the time, and uh, so I go fishing uh, with them, and we fish, and we catch everything but fish. We catch old shoes. We catch, you know, we, we catch tires. <laughs> we, we, we catch anything but a fish in this nasty, this nasty water that is supposed to, to be fresh. And I, you know, I started thinking that. It reminds me of the murkiness of my mind when I think about from a natural basis about holiness and what I'm supposed to receive and get from being holy. What am I supposed to get? And, and, and yet I too have adopted those, those weird views of what holiness is. I, I, I can see that. You know, mine even goes as far as you gotta have the sandals. I'm, I think more in the biblical times, you gotta have the sandals on and you know, you gotta maybe eat some, some grasshoppers and uh, locusts and some wild honey, you know, and you got to have like, you know, of the 24 hours that you're awake, 23 and a half hours need to be spent in prayer. You know, um, I mean, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, the desert, you know, and, and all these things of, of, of what holiness is or moral purity is. But then I thought about, too, you know, when someone tries to be holy, they, they try to live morally. And as Miguel said, have that influence from those around them. We can tend to look at them and say they're weird, fanatical, self-righteous, and even judgmental. Don't let somebody tell you, you know, you're not living as God has called you to live. Don't you judge me. Who are you to tell me? Well, I'm just telling you what I see. And so we pull back because we, 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 we have this, this view of what holiness is. The fact is, is that holiness has its place in our everyday life. Moral purity, it's not a, it's not a thing that we, we talk about or we, we, we bring into our lives on Sunday or maybe even on Wednesday, maybe at a Bible talk we're together, maybe every now and then when we're praying with someone. But the reality of it is holiness is the business every day of every Christian. It should be evidenced by the decisions we make, by the things we do, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Holiness should be presence in all that we do. There's no separation. This is the reason why lives are not powerful. Like Popeye, you got to eat your spinach, something good for you. But this is the reason why there's confusion, and this is the reason why there's weakness in our walks and why our faith don't grow the way we want it to grow. Because there's usually some area where we've compromised our moral purity. Maybe we cave into the weight, the pressure. You know, it's hard to do the right thing. Usually doing the right thing, you will get isolated from those not doing the right thing. 
And unfortunately, we live in the last days, and there will be terrible times when people will be brutal, they'll be treacherous, and lovers of themselves, and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, yet they will have a, a, a form of godliness. He's talking about the church there. And we run, but we want power. We want change in our life. What do you really want? Anything you want, you got to work. It does not come. It's not easy. Let me tell you something. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Everybody would have it if it was easy. Nobody wants to run that extra mile. That's why it's lonely when you run it. Nobody wants to put in that, that extra time. I'm going to live my life from the Lord. Like Joshua said, I don't care what y'all do for me and my household. Amen. We are going to serve the Lord. But people want power living or success, don't they? What is the definition of a sex? This is a person or a thing that achieves desired aims or attains prosperity. That's what the world says success is. You reach a certain goal or you attain prosperity. You get rich. And let's be honest. We look at people with a mansion, a Mercedes, and a big bank account, and we say they are successful. And we'll give them that no matter what's going on in their life. They're very successful. That is the reason. Our success in our lives is based on what we can acquire and what we can accomplish as opposed to being approved by God. I put before you any man, woman, that can put their head on their pillow and know that they have served their God with all their hearts, minds, soul, and strength. They are approved by God and they are successful. We want that power. Do you know that there's a great power available to you? There's a great power available to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. Delron received that today. Tony received that today. This power that comes through the Holy Spirit is given to us to give us the, def the power to defeat Satan, all of his hosts, and to overcome any obstacle that would ever come in our lives. But you have to tap into it. You have to tap into it. You have to make it yours. It can't be something you know about. It's got to be something you are about. Paul says in Philippians, while being in prison, not knowing the day of his death to come, he writes this in Philippians 3, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him even in death. What he's saying right here, I want to tap into this power. We're talking about a power that raised Jesus from the dead. We're not talking about self-help books. We're not talking about some wise guru. We're not talking about any humanistic idea here. We're talking about the power that can only come from God, the actual power to raise from death to life all of us that are dead in sin, as he did for Jesus Christ. He said, I want to become like him in death. It's kind of a play here on words. How many of you know that Jesus is not dead? He says, I want to become like him in death so as to live. How many of you want eternal life? How many of you know that when these mortal bodies are dead, that God is going to raise your spirit? He says, I want to know this power. What are you after knowing in your life? This is what I want to know. This is power living. In Acts 2, 36, as we read earlier with Miguel, therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive this Holy Spirit. The power to live your life. It's in you. 
in you and must be manifested in everything you do on a daily basis. It must be there. It must be your union with it in order to walk powerfully. Psalms 12 is very clear of what God wants. He wants us to be blessed. He wants our children to be blessed. He wants the generation and generation to be blessed. Blessed is not necessarily bringing you a bunch of money and wealth, but blessed, happy, superlatively happy because I have God's approval. He wants mankind to be reconciled to himself and to be his. When you want something different than what God wants, that's where the confusion comes in. God wants us to be secure in our relationship with him. God wants us to trust him for our, all of our needs. Most importantly, God wants us to obey him because he sees that as love. He says, obey me if you love me. Why is there so much doubt and insecurity in the Christian world? I didn't say the world. I said the Christian world where we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, we're certain of what we don't see, sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we don't see, right? Why is there so much doubt and insecurity? Why, why, is so many, why can so many just walk and doubt everything? When I was a, a boy, I, 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 I stole something, and uh, when I stole it, I felt strange, insecure about everything about it. Another time I told a lie. You ever lied to your mom and dad? Come on, raise your hand. And then when you get in front of them, you just know they know. <laughs> right? You, you ever do something and you just know, everybody know what you did. Right? Yeah. That insecurity just, just comes on you in a major way. Well, the definition of insecurity is this. is is being unsure, unstable, shaky, apprehensive, or lacking in self-confidence. Does any one of those describe you? There can be no power living in insecurity. There can be none. Fear and faith cannot coexist. Doubt and faith cannot coexist. It cannot coexist. There will be one or the other. You are either fearful or faithful. Never the two together. How does this insecurity show itself? Well, we look at our lives and you might perceive this for some of you, maybe some of you not, but it shows itself with powerless living. We, we don't have impact. I'm talking about godly impact on someone's life. We struggle personally with the same character issue or sin. Over and over, just the same thing. More purity, making the decision to do right, separating yourself for the Lord. We have exaggerated fears. Somebody's talking about me. Yeah. We have misunderstood perceptions of people. We, we think people are against us. You know, somebody tries to help us, and we get defensive with them. We don't see the love in accountability. We just think somebody's trying to control us. I bet you if I saw that man out there, like I said before, ready to shoot you, and I said, don't go out there, you'd appreciate me telling you what to do at that point. Yeah. Yeah, but to delve into your morality, that, 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 that thing that's in your character, and say, cut that away. Now I'm, I'm judging you. We do a thing, we, we start self-protecting, and then we shut other people out. Don't let nobody in there. This is what insecurities do. We have this idea, this is what we do. Maybe some of y'all been there. I'm going to reject them before they reject me. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh-huh. Because I'm insecure. Or we work super hard to gain acceptance. Overly. 
gain acceptance of those that are around us. It results in a few things. Poor choices, number one. It results in some very poor choices. It results in the poor choices of the friends we choose around us. It, it, we pick the wrong ones. And that destroys our life. We're, we're afraid to walk with the eagles. We're afraid to be with those that walk with God and, and stay away from those that don't. And even when we get in those relationships, we, make, we start compromising and suddenly, uh, particularly in, in, in relationships between men and women, you know, because they, they, they've learned by example that love is sex. And so they begin to compromise. One or the other wants to leave the relationship, and they think they got to give them sex to keep them. Let me tell you something. How we build our lives will determine our faith. It would either build it or it will destroy it. To the degree that we live moral lives will determine your faith. You can't still lie and cheat and expect to be strong in your faith. You can't compromise the word of God and expect to be strong in your faith. It doesn't happen that way. The Bible warns us this way. Look over in 1 Thessalonians with me real quick. And it tells us to flee our youthful thinking, our, our, our lust of our, our youth, and, and to flee from it. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, starting in verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. As in fact you're living, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. But you know what instruction we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. There's that word again, set aside. Some of us still need to set ourselves aside. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject human beings, but God, the, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Don't kill the preacher. To reject these words that would come, it, 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 it's not a rejection of me. It's a rejection of God. Let's look at some of these things uh, that we claim. Turn to Exodus 20. We, we, this is just a broad base, but we've forgotten some of the things that God has commanded for us to, to live by. In Exodus 20, you guys know your Ten Commandments. In verse 2, it starts off, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. I brought you out. Not man, no human being, but I, I gave you salvation. I brought you out. I sacrificed my son. I came down from heaven as a man and let you whoop and beat on me and spit on me and betray me. I did that for you. I am the one who rescued you. Egypt has always been correlated with the bondage of sin. He says, I am the one who has freed you out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on earth or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. How does that work? Many have asked that question. It's because the parents set the example. Kids follow the example of those uh, in front of them. And if you are a certain way as a parent, let me tell you something, your kid is going to be that way. My kids definitely have picked up all the wrongs of my life. And so the curse of the generation goes on and on and on until someone stops that. We want to save the next generation, then let's be saved. We want to change the next generation. Let's change right now. There's no voodoo curse. Woo, woo, woo. We are the tools of the generation curse. He says, I'm doing this 
for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not misuse my name, the Lord your God, for the Lord your God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land and the Lord your God is giving you. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not give false testimony against your neighbor, you should not covet your neighbor's house, you should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. He gets real clear and specific and, and tells us, and he, you know, where is this in our society today? Stealing, killing, adultery. Even the Sabbath was meant to just give us a perspective of the holiness of a day. God is like, look, look, I created all this in six days and then I took a break to reflect, to look. He said he saw all that he did and it was good. And he wants us to do the same. And some have a hard time just to, to get there on that day, just to worship, to have a day of holiness. I mean, you know that how people come in church. I mean, it still fills up in here about 10, 15, 10, 20. Yeah. I mean, even still, the aura, the energy and that, that, that is brought to church. It's a holy day of worship and fellowship with one another. Right? So many of us. Remember, we come to give. We come to excite God with with just our praise and worship of him. And we share that experience with one another. You know, what gives us the insecurity is when we have a violation of moral purity. It saps the power directly from us. We've got to change through two things based on this first Thessalonian passage that, that Paul talks about here. Number one, in our walks, we have to excel. In our walks with Jesus, we have to excel. There's no place for mediocrity and average living for a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's no place. That's not power. In 1 Thessalonians, he says this in verse 1 2. Remember this part of it. He says, For the matters, brothers and sisters, we instruct you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you're living. He's saying you're doing some great things. And let me tell you something this region in the church has done some great things. I love this region. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I, I, I try to be a little tough like my coach was on me. I remember screaming at him, like, why are you so tough on me? I lead the team in everything. Why are you so tough on me? And he says, because I love you and I know there's more in you to give and I'm not going to stop until you're giving your best. So don't expect me to get up here and go, everything's cool. And fuzzy when it's not. When there's growth that needs to take place, I'm going to preach to it. When there's love that needs to grow, I'm going to preach to it. When there's excellence and discipline that needs to be developed, I'm going to preach to it. Because that's real love, that we don't let you settle for mediocrity and average living. There's no power in that. There's no power in that. There's no success in that. And Paul says, yeah, you're living, but now as we ask you and urge you, urging and pleading and pushing you, in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, to excel now. You have made the team now become an expert. You have grown a little now, start teaching. I mean, he says, look, go for it. So many of you are holding back. Go, go for it. He says, get it in. We had this saying when I played ball and the game, we'd be down a little bit and coach would come to me and say, hey, Blackwell, I need you to get me buckets. I need buckets. That means you got to score a lot. Go get me some buckets. We're a little stifled here. Get me buckets. Get going. You've scored a little bit. I appreciate it. You've played some good D, but I need you to get some buckets now. I need you to go on another gear. 
And God is saying that to us, hey, you done made a few buckets, but it's time to really get them now. It's time to get going here. It's time to really excel in your Christian walk. It's time to be better than we've ever been before. But you've got to decide to do that. Some of us are still just sitting and we're, we're accepting and we're okay with status quo. Well, that's the churches you came from before. Or that was the world you just came out of. But that has no place in the kingdom of God. Forceful men and women lay hold to the kingdom. Forceful men and women get into the kingdom of heaven. You don't almost be right and get into heaven. You can't play the game and quit on the last day. You still don't get in. Paul said, look, we done taught you everything. We've instructed you on everything. Now it's your time to become an expert. But you got to go do it. It takes work. That's what's wrong on the street with 10 churches. That's all that's there, 10 buildings. Can you imagine a community of Christians where everyone in that community is excelling? We don't have a climbing abortion rate. We have one ending. We don't have teen pregnancy going higher. We have it ending. We don't have murder rates increasing. We have them ending. We don't have a, a educational dropouts happening. We have graduates happening. We don't have the impurity and, and the broken hearts and relationships when we have people looking to excel in their Christianity. You look to get by, you fall all the time. If you've been a C student, it's time for you to be a B. If you've been a B student, it is time for you to be an A. If you have not got your undergraduate, it's time for you to graduate and shoot for your master's. If you got your master's, it's time for you to get your PhD in this thing called Christian life. But it's enough is said of being just average status quo. It's time for you to grow up in the Lord and be excellent in your walk. How do we do that? How do we do that? Because as you, let me taste it. You talk like I'm talking right now. You're weird now. Here I go again, right? I'm weird. I'm self-righteous now, right? I'm judgmental, right? You understand what I'm saying here, right? To really expect that of you, I must be out of my mind, right? I'm asking too much, right? For you to use and tap into the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. I must be crazy. What is wrong with me that I would have the audacity to believe you can do that? What we need to do, we got we to gotta excel, but we also have got to, in our morals, we have got to be sanctified, be set aside. There's too many similarities in the church and the world. Too many similarities. Paul gives a strong admonishment here. And he says, to be sanctified. I'm going to ask everyone here, with, with, with the hearing of, of my voice today, to set yourself aside for God. To change your heart today. To set yourself aside. To make a declaration, a proclamation that I will live solely and wholeheartedly for my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Don't say I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to set myself aside. I will abstain. I will do whatever is necessary. Colossians 3 says to do everything as doing it for the Lord. When I go to work tomorrow, I will do it as a disciple of Jesus. And I'll be bold as one. When I go to school tomorrow, I will do it as a disciple of Jesus. When I go home with my spouse, I will do it as a disciple of Jesus. Amen. When I'm in a relationship with my parents, I will do it as a disciple of Jesus. When my business dealings, I will do it as a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. I am set aside. When hatred enters my heart, I will drive it away. I am a disciple of Jesus. When my critical heart comes in, I will drive it aside because I am a disciple of Jesus. I'm about building up people, not tearing them down. I'm about the, being a champion, not being a loser. Because that's what my Jesus was, a champion. You must make God's standard your standards now. It's not enough to repent, but you need to change your mind and heart to agree with God. And you know when you agree with God, when you start walking as Jesus did, 1 John 2, 6. If we claim to be in him, then we must walk as Jesus did. I'll give you an idea. It is tough, but it is doable. 
In John 5, 19, here is Jesus, bad boy, walked on water, raised from the dead, took five people and a few pieces of fish and a bread and fed them, full, extra left over. This was a bad guy. He was so powerful that the centurion who asked him to heal his daughter that was miles away, Jesus was going to go with him to heal that girl. He said, no, you don't need to go. Just say the word, and I know she's healed. Jesus is powerful. Jesus has those answers. Jesus is a bad boy. But look what he says in John 5, 19. When he was challenged himself about him doing work on the Sabbath and doing things on the Sabbath, he said this. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. This is the baddest man to ever walk the face of the earth, the most powerful individual, bar no second. He said, I can do only what he sees his father doing. I can only say what he tells me to say. I can only do what he tells me to do. And this was him. And he had to fight to make his father's standards his. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he played three times, God, take this cup from me, but not as I will as you will. Three times, once didn't work, twice didn't work. The third time was a charm. He got up, walked to the cross. Thank goodness he did. We need to make God's standard our standards, not just in words. Our, our, our moral purity, and, 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 and many of you will have different ideas about it so much. I'm not just talking about sex. I'm talking about the way you love. I'm talking about the way you serve. I'm talking about the way you give respect. We're talking so much bigger than the, the obvious things. You want power in your lives? Then start living a pure life. We've got to refocus our way of thinking. Just a few quick things here in closing out. Number one with all these temptations. All these temptations, they're always going to be there, right? Yeah. But we have a question when they come. Why is God letting me be tempted with this? Let me help you out. James 1, verse 13, 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. <laughs> that, that, that throws that out. We're going to get to the root, but that throws that out, right? Don't be saying God has tempted you. For God cannot be tempted by evil. You got nothing to do with God. Our evil action, thoughts, or deeds have nothing to do with God. He is not capable of even putting that into your mind. All right, now, don't stone me, but here it goes. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires about what you can get. By definition, it's selfish. It's what you get. Uh-oh. And in taste, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown up, gives birth to what? Yeah. Oh, my God. Does that explain some things? A little less confusing. The first trick is to not blame God. It is in us, and we must crucify it. Number two, we have got to get serious about how we go about finding happiness. It's not going to be found in money. It's not going to be found in the success of the world. It's not going to be found in things or places or people. It's not going to happen. Success doesn't happen that way. Not the Christian success. Matthew 5, 8 says this, Blessed are those that are pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed, happy are they. Blessed, happy meaning approved by God. That's why I'm happy. And I get to see God on top of it. Learn, number three, to appreciate God's discipline of your life. Don't respond like we did as children when mommy and daddy spanked us. Why are you spanking me? Or if you was like me, when my mom came to whoop me, I'd go run, jump on the bed, and start kicking my legs and everything so she couldn't get to me. And she said, boy, if you kick me. But them legs would still be going. I'd do anything to stop her discipline. <laughs> Hebrews 12 says this, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Let me tell you something about life, guys, and even so, more so in the Christian life. Life will teach you the same lesson over and 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 over until you get it. You 
got the same thing happening in your life? Learn the lesson. Learn the lesson. Stop going there. Stop getting that. Stop being that. Change your thinking. You're insane doing the same thing over and over and wanting something different. And today is going to be different, but I'm going to do the same thing. Two and two is going to be five tomorrow. Three and three is going to be seven. Four and four is going to be nine. And five and five is going to be 11. It ain't going to never happen. Two and two is going to be four. Three and three is going to be six. Four and four is going to be eight. And five and five is going to always be ten. It ain't going to change. And finally, we got to develop genuine love in here. Genuine love. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love is patient and kind and does not envy, does not boast. It doesn't speak badly to each other or about each other. It does not dishonor others. It has no negative word for one another. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. It never, ever, ever, ever fails. We need to develop that for one another. Today we need to clear our conscience with it. And we need to develop three disciplines. Number one is quiet times. For those of you visiting us, you know what I'm talking about? That's your presence. That's your time you get in the presence with God. Too much we want to deal with this world and not have had some present time with God. Anytime you do that, you're just operating on your wisdom, not God's. You're operating on your strength, not God's. Psalms 119 says, how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to the word of God? Amen. Our prayer life. Some of us need to make the decision that we are going to pray. We're going to pray. I know there are things that I just can't fix. There are things that I can't fix. There are plans and dreams I have for my family, for my kids. For the I can't fix them. I can pray for them. And if my prayers are righteous, I believe God will answer. Psalms 45, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. To all who, yeah, who, all who call on him in truth. Can I go to God not in truth? And lastly, this is huge. Because this is the one that goes all the way back to the beginning. How we put up the walls and keep others out is our discipleship relationships. There's a deficiency of one being in the life of another. All that is needed is two people and a Bible. All the answers there. They're, the, the only authority there at that point is the scriptures. But some of us have been void of that, have not gone for that, have negotiated that, and it is shipwrecking our faith. Because you were meant to grow. You were meant to grow. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17, is iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. Who is sharpening you? Dull. Not making an impact for the Lord the way we need to. Not making an impact in each other's lives the way we need to. Who is sharpening you? Who are allowing you to be sharpened? Who are you allowing to sharpen you? And who are you sharpening? I'm thankful for the men in my life. I'm thankful. If I can't get it one place, I go get it another. I got no problem with somebody putting something good into my life. There's no need for the defenses of it only the receiving of it. So, moral purity. Yeah? Amen. Amen. You can look at things as do's and don'ts, or you can look at things as power living. Power living. Because success, the price of success is discipline. The price of a righteous life is the discipline of the Lord's command. You can be powerful if you choose today. If you don't know the Lord in this way, it's time for you to study the Bible. For real, not read some scriptures. <laughs> it's time for you to get in there and make some decisions for your life. Those of you that are not living victoriously and powerfully, it's time for you to make some decisions. I will set myself aside to be used for the Lord. And for those of you that are doing well and, and you feel you have a powerful life going on, then you need to stop sitting here by yourself, coming in this church empty-handed, and bring someone else that can learn that word of God with you. If we, if, if we don't do these things, then we're no different than any other group out there. We want to be the Lord's church. And we're not that because we say it. The church started in the first century. We didn't start it. We're the Lord's church if we do what the Lord's church does. No man has a monopoly on that. We all can do that. So I love you guys. 
I hope I'm not stoning the way out, but I want you to live powerfully. I want you to live powerfully and not mediocre or average to God's glory. Amen. We're going to have the song leaders come and we're going to sing a final closing song.